If you've ever wondered how fly lines are made, like us, we're gonna learn how today. We're here at Rio. I heard a rumor that they're not just made out of spaghetti noodles that are boiled enough so that they're pliable, okay? It's real technology, it's freaking science, okay? I saw an ad with guys with lab coats on in there. This is serious. Let's go get educated, Brig. This is Wayne and Brent and Chris. Why don't you tell us what you guys do and uh, what this is all about? My name is Wayne Peterson and I'm a product developer. I work in the R&D department and I started right here in 2005. Oh, oh, oh. So I was part of quite a few of these things. I didn't move into product development until 2015. So I did a lot of some of the jobs that we'll see today. Um, we started in 1990. And when we started, we actually didn't sell any fly lines, leaders, tippet, or actually like fly fishing. It was more like general, some stuff that would help you, some gadgets. We were selling notebooks, knot tires, and then these little boxes that were actually eight millimeter film cartridge Holy boxes crap. that we figured you could actually just spool a fly line on because that fit perfectly. I gotta read this. The waterproofed floatable notebook. But Not waterproof, but waterproofed. Waterproofed. <laughs> it looks like it went from 1990 to like 1947. So 1994, what? we were selling fly lines. Oh, there you go. You can see that we had things like the wind cutter and accelerator, some of our original products that were created from splicing different lines together. Yeah. Were commercially available. By the late 90s, we were actually manufacturing here in this facility that we're going to oh, wow. take you through. And this is the catalog and evolution ever since. My name's Chris Walker, and I manage the product development group here at Rio. Uh, I've been here since about 2017. On our catalog wall, that makes me a, a bottom row guy only. Uh, Wayne, I'm sure, remembers much more of this up here, but yeah, 2017 is when I came on. My name is Brent Hermanison. I'm the Southern Rockies rep. I cover Colorado, Utah, and New Mexico. And I've only got like part of the last 22 catalog into 23, so. Newest one here. <clears throat> it is with great thought that I've decided today to take my talents to the Rio factory for today only. All right, so I just need to sign here? Yep. Okay. Sign I've been, your life away. I've been working on this signature. Let's check it out. <laughs> Look at that, though. It's pretty official. I like that. That thing will appraise. Look at high. that. It'll appraise high. <laughs> Brent, Brent said it first. All right, yeah, but we really have to do this. There's a lot of science that goes into this um, that gives it that magical, real fly line, brand new out of the box feeling. Before we get into the factory itself, uh, there's some stuff we'll be able to film up and close. Uh, other stuff we won't be able to, to get on film, unfortunately, but we just wanted to give you a quick rundown of what goes into a fly line. Mm -hmm. So there's really two main components. You've got uh, a core and then a coating. So the core gives you all the strength of the fly line, determines some of the stiffness properties, mm -hmm. uh, and as well as stretch. Mm -hmm. So they come in a couple different flavors. We've got braided core. You can feel that one's nice and supple. Oh yeah, is this like a 20 pound test or is it higher? Or? That's 20 pound, yep. Nice. So that'd be a, a core you'd typically find in a trout line, something you need to be supple in the water to give mm -hmm. you a nice drag free drift. This is a monofilament core, which is a lot stiffer. Mm -hmm. That's actually a lot stronger too. So that's typically what we would use in a tropical fly mm -hmm. line, mostly because you need it to be stiffer mm -hmm. when you're in those tropical conditions. You want it to shoot well through the guides. We, we have people come in all the time that want to buy an eight weight fly line to take it to Alaska and they don't understand why they can't take a bonefish line. <laughs> Oh, like, yeah. Well, you can. It's just not going to be very fun. <laughs> yeah, that's but a good, good demonstration there of the reason. You don't yeah. want your, your Alaskan trout line to be stiff as a board up there right. when it's cold. So that's core. Uh, the next component is coating. And basically, our coatings start off as a liquid plastisol. So you can see it's not... Not the most visually interesting thing, just some goo and a vial there. Plastisol, do they make like bass baits out of that too or something? They Maybe do. I'm thinking of the wrong they stuff. Do. Oh, really? They do. Yeah, so you, that's the same type of stuff then. Mm -hmm. A little but, different formulation. So you just take one of this and you 
paint on a little plastisol, boom, fly line, right? You got Precisely. it. Yeah. Start making yeah. it yeah. Own. We don't need yep. those and these those non disclosures. You know, we <laughs> figured that out right off the bat. We just disclosed it. We can do it. <laughs> oh my bad. Uh, yeah. So anyway, we got the plastisol here. Um, this is hard to control the density of. There's other other factors that we're trying to control with this, like hardness or softness and slickness mm -hmm. to make your fly line shoot nicely. So of course we add something else to it to either make it float or sink. Uh, this is a vial of micro balloons, which is what, what makes a fly line float. Can I open this right here, or will it? You can. You don't can. shake it up. I mean, okay. you can kind of see what it looks like. I just want to look in. Oh yeah, kind of, it looks like frog's fanny or something like exactly. that. Kind of the yeah, same yeah. consistency. Yep. Yeah, so each of those is a really small glass bubble, and we put glass. That, yep, exactly. Put that in the fly line coating, and that That's decreases crazy. the density. Yeah, this yeah. does uh, exactly the opposite. That's a vial Ooh. of tungsten powder. You can this see is, the weight difference. Yeah, there. this is what I'm talking about. This is where you make your money. <laughs> Getting deep. Yep, that's <laughs> awesome, man. So, so are these just different colors, different consistencies of different everything? Exactly. Yeah. So these are these are fully mixed batches. So ah, cool. those are going to include either your your flotation, you know, your micro balloons, mm -hmm. or your tungsten. These ones happen to all be floating batches, but then we add pigment as well to oh, get the, cool. the colors of your fly line. So basically everything we're going to show you today in our factory is a method for combining all these materials to make a fly line. Cool. Um, so from here we'll head across the parking lot into our production area. We'll meet up with our plant manager Jake, uh -huh. as well as our manufacturing engineer Alan, and they'll show you a little bit of uh, the production stuff. First stop will be the core drying room. Core drying room. Yeah, so we're heading across the parking lot. This is where all our production takes place for fly lines. The building we just came from is some office space as well as some warehouse space. Nice. How many employees do you think you have working here at uh, any given time? We've got about 70 and it's spread nice. out across three different shifts. Oh, wow. Um, yeah, we That's work a, five days a week, uh, 24 hours a day. So there is some- Dang. Yeah, a lot of man hours going to making fly lines. Bunch of savages out there needing fly lines that bad. That's awesome. Yeah, exactly. That's a lot of work. That's that's my nerdy HR question. You know, that's <laughs> yeah. that's how my brain works. We can stop in with them if you got any more. <laughs> no, <laughs> I've been I've been avoiding it. <laughs> we all try. I'm Alan Walker. Alan, Alan, good to meet you, man. Manufacturing process engineer. So you're a process engineer. So tell us what you do. So the the manufacturing process, we're looking at improvements that we can make to the product itself, things that we haven't been able to manufacture into the the lines themselves before, keep everything running, minimize downtime, um, increase the consistency and the quality, yeah, that's reduce awesome. costs. We're gonna start with uh, where we store the, the core that goes into our fly lines. Whoa. What you notice first thing in Ooh, here? It's hot. Toasty. And it's not just me this time. <laughs> Holy crap. So we're very interested in controlling the humidity within the ah, core itself. Okay. Because uh, if you put that plastic on, there's humidity. Throw it in night, a hot, hot oven, start steaming the line. Uh, you're going to have all sorts of non-desirable things happening. So it probably won't even make it out of the oven, right? Uh, it, would, it would get rejected in our, ah, in our process. Perfect. Yeah. So yeah, we've got monofilament and braid in here. Lots of different configurations for different line types. You can see mostly production stuff on the left and right here. And we've got some, some R&D prototyping stuff on the on the back shelf there as well. And That's yeah, really, cool. really tight controls for humidity, um, the amount of time that the core is in here to let the, the humidity in the in this spool work itself all the way out. Yeah. It takes a while to get the, the wraps that are all the way on the inner hub of that spool yeah, yeah. to get that water out of there. On a cold winter day, do you just come in here for a few days right when you come into work to warm up? It, that, that, it can have that effect. Because there's like 10 months of winter here in Idaho. <laughs> and this would be like, I want to put one of these in our shop now. Yep, yep. it doesn't we'll do take some, too long. We do some hot yoga. <laughs> Because <laughs> I'm super into fitness, you know. I can give you some pointers later. Oh, thanks, Brig. <laughs> Got a broken foot. <laughs> Kicking too much butt lately, Brig. Now we're headed to the next step in fly line production, which would be mixing our plastisol. Okay, let's go check it out. My name is Carl Amundsen. 
I'm the process and systems supervisor for Rio products. Nice. How long have you been here? Uh, coming up on uh, four years. What What does your day to day look like here at Rio? Um, I manage all the teams that make the plastisol, that are the oven operators that make the lines, and then the techs that support them in the ah, process. cool. So we're going to head over to the mixing room. This is where we kind of start everything for the fly line production. So we have a multitude of different batches that we use for our uh, plastisol coatings. Yeah. We have mixers on top of each of these bit large totes because they're yeah. large volume. That way we can ensure that the product stays as homogenous as possible. What we do is we turn it into fly lines and this is kind of our cookie cabinet. Are you wow. hungry? Yeah, what are, what, what are we doing? So these are cookies. Um, these are our batch standards for color. So every recipe will have a standard that we have to match to. So Chris and Wayne will dream up what the next colorway is going to be for one of our lines. Okay. And then we will run tests, we will validate that, yep, this is what they want, and then we set that standard. So then I go in, I sign every one of them, and say, yep, that's what the mixers are going to use for that. Um, this is all of our current. Uh, this down here is Legacy. There's actually more over here. Wow. So this is just to dial in the color or are there any consistency? To retain the color. Retain so that the way color. we can color match it every time. Uh, so when you look at densities of, of plastisol, okay, so these two are about the same thickness, right? Yeah. Okay, so fill those. No, just fill the thickness. Oh. Okay, agree they're about the same thickness? Yeah. Okay, that one versus that one. Oh yeah, it's totally different. Same and there, space. Yeah, and that's why you can have a sinking line that feels just like a floating line when you cast it. Exactly. So let me that's put you on the spot. Cool. What okay. weighs more, a five weight floating or five weight sinking? Yes, <laughs> both the same. Good. That's like, I got one for you. Huh? What weighs more, 10 pounds of tungsten or 10 pounds of feathers? They all weigh the same, it's 10 exactly. pounds. Exactly, 10 pounds is 10 pounds. Okay, so the process we go through for mixing starts here with the plastisol. Yeah. We, we dispense it out into large buckets, then we carry them around, we weigh them out over here, and then we add any of our additives, which is like our floaty bits, which is what makes it float, yeah. our sinky bits, which makes it sink, um, and then any other small additives. Do you and think it, that, real quick, not yeah. to interrupt you, but that's great terminology for fly tying. Mm -hmm. I'm just going to start calling anything that makes the fly float the floaty bits. Yes. And the other ones are the sinky bits. Yeah, that's what I, oh, I, I tie too, it. so All that's right. what I do. You guys want more detail in fly tying? No, nah, we're going the other way. Yes. Okay, so Brian is mixing up a batch. He want to show nice. you. So this is a float batch. So wow. this one has floaty bits, color added to it. So we, when we add the, the floaty bits, we have to encapsulate the top with a cover so they don't spill out. But we use vacuum air to evacuate and capture anything so that the Dude. health of the mixtures are safe. Wow, yes. This is like the Western family macaroni and cheese color. With this one, it's gonna be more about color blend. Yeah. And so this one will blend in quick. So they'll take it scrape down the sides and make sure it's fully incorporated. Cool. After they do that, they'll take, come over here and they will run it through a filter process. The filtering is simply, you to put a clean bucket inside, put a filter on top, run it through, and that'll catch any little particulates, cookie crumbs from your nutter butters, stuff like that. <laughs> yeah. Um, so it, that way we don't get, or minimize the defects that go Honestly, in. Honestly though, like the, the nutter butter line's gonna fish better than any the other line. smell? Yeah, yeah. Exactly. Browns are good, brown trouts are gonna love it. <laughs> yeah. So after we go through the filtering oh, process, that's right, then we do a vacuum process. Oh, cool. Um, that just pulls out any air so that we get a true density so that when we're testing before we send it out to the oven room, that it's truly an eight, you know, it's it's the right density for float or the right density for sink. Yeah. I'm a huge fan of the sweep lines. Yes. So the density, the multiple density is very critical. Yes, yes. So we yeah. make certain that everything matches what, what it's supposed to be. Put that on here. And we take that weight, so that's exactly within our standard of where we need to be for our density. Then after they do the density test, they'll take and we'll check viscosity. Now, in our trout lines, it's not gonna be as critical to do some matches, but when you do your sweep lines and dual densities, then it's critical that the, de that the viscosities match. Do people don't realize that their fly lines just start out as a snack pack first. Yeah. This, is, this is like pudding viscosity. Yeah, it's kind of like, awesome. a, you know, like honey. We have some that are like molasses. I mean, there's a whole range of, of yeah. viscosities we do. It'll give us our exact viscosity. Um, and then we can make certain that when we run lines that have multiple sections of, of different types, sinks, floats, etc., that they're all gonna play well together. Yeah. The last thing is we wanna make sure we have our color match. Hey Brian, can you give me the 5001 cookie? 
So this is a system that we bought which allows us to really validate color. And so he's going to get us our target, which is our golden sample. Thank you. So definitely, definitely not just an eyeball test. No. Okay, so there's our target. So you, oh, that's crazy. And then that's the one he baked. Got a good pass. With all the shops and everything, we want to make certain they get product that looks the same. Oh, yeah. Know us by color, Absolutely. by certain lines. Yeah. Um, it's the right thing to do. And as a shop owner, you know, you get a, a company that does like dubbing and they're dyeing it and every dye lot's different. And then the customer comes to you and they're thinking, what? Are, they're saying, why are you changing the bags? Like, not me. Not me, man. Yeah. That's way cool. So we do have to play that game though. So with like, this is all our pigment that we use, right? Oh, So sweet. we have all kinds of different things we have to play with. So the color validation is really critical because we'll have to change because we might get like one batch would come in with a little bit more intensity of color. So we have to change our recipe slightly. But this ah. is where we catch it and ensure yeah. that what goes out is yeah. consistent. And usually That's it's crazy. within a margin of error that's hardly hard to notice, but sometimes it'll be a big swing and you're like, wow. Yeah, yeah. Solid work on the mixing. That purple one's fire. All right, so we're gonna go to, I don't know, some part of the process that's secret, right? <laughs> yep. No cameras allowed? No cameras. That means you have to stay out here, Brigham. This is great. Let's do this every day. <laughs> Read it and wait, Rick. Finally, a fly line long enough for my lot sessions. I had to make me a 1500 foot fly line. In all honesty though, there's some wizardry going in there. We can't talk about it. But all they do is they take like a bunch of string and plastic, they throw it in the, this machine, and it spits out necklaces. So, it's a cool process though. Like. 4,000 things that you would never think of. Next part of the process, once we get these skeins made, is we've got to divide those skeins into individual lines, right? There's 15 lines on that one that you brought out. Other than you, nobody else can cast a 1,500 foot line. Most of us mere well, mortals, yeah. right? We got to do a smaller line. So uh, Rosie here is going to show us how that's done. Cool. Uh, How's it going, Rosie? Good. How are you? Good. Let, I'm going to come stand over here. <laughs> All right. So what Rosie's doing here is uh, she's going to take this line, wind it, and she's going to ins hand inspect every inch of that line. So every inch of that line is going through her fingers. She's checking for any kind of bumps or anything that shouldn't be there, and then to show the difference between the two lines, we, we purposely put two big bumps in there that show her where one starts and one ends. So when she feels that, then she'll stop, then she'll trim the line. So right there. Yep. So that's the end of running line of one line and the, the tip of the next one. Oh, wow. That's very critical when we're putting those on reels. <laughs> you want that sticker, yep. So you know which end to go where. Oh, and this is the process that everyone wants to see. I've taken off about four billion of those. She's had a little bit of practice in making those nice and tight. Yeah. Rosie's been doing this for 17 years now. You should give it a try. See how it works. Dude, I'm I, I'm a ninja. Raising the table for you right now. Dude. I might, I, I'm putting my safety glasses on. Sorry to kick you guys out of your space. Foot so she's control. Already, she's already got it there. And I've got... Foot control is the bane of your whole Dude, look at this. Oh. Does your foot fit? You may have to use your other foot. Bro, I'm telling you what, I I have been uh, killing it with this thing. So, so uh, we're going to have a race here. We're going to see. You have to push that in the middle. Right here? No, in the middle. Right here? There. That's the safety so you don't accidentally kick it on top. Okay. Can I go now? Wait, 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 wait. On your marks, get set, go. Wait, 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 wait. Nope. Hey, they said they said stop, Rosie. Wait, there's a clutch in this. Yes, there is. What in the? No, this thing sucks. We got to keep ours. Brigham. <laughs> this thing's no good. You know, if it were me, I'd make it wider. And the one that I have doesn't doesn't. I got a broken foot. So Rosie's done now. I don't think you're quite out of the head yet. Is it? There's is, a running line. Is this going to affect my contract that I just signed with you guys? You're going on there. Almost there. So you're filling for two long bumps that'll tell you where the line bumps. is. Bumps. Okay. Bumps are right here. Dude, 
You might want to redo this one. Right. Or is it doable? That one's probably going to the trash can. Too. Right. Okay, cool. I'll just take it. Wait, 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 wait. I'm going for the second one. Yeah, round number two. Me estás haciendo la trampa. Wait, wait, wait. Which which side to the reel? Uh, the blue side. This side? Where do I cut it? Right at the bump. Right at the bump? Yep. So, yeah, I left some generous room here. Dude, this is where these stickers come from, Brigham. Somewhere right here? Yep. We're going to put a loop on that line anyway, so... I think she's on her third line, so number three. Okay, I already I screwed up the sticker. Okay, this is the secret. We tricked her. This is like when you tell your kids, I bet you can't go get me a soda out of the fridge. <laughs> she's working like double time now. Thanks to old Cheech, you just got four fly lines for the price of one. Oh my gosh. I swear, I can tie flies and everything. I'm a pro tire, I'm not a pro freaking line winder. What do I do now? This? Yep. That. Bada bing, bada boom. <laughs> oh, they're laughing at me now. <laughs> Where is HR? We're talking to HR. She's laughing. She's laughing. So once we've uh, put those coils into, separated the, the skein into individual coils, the next part of the process is for loops, right? This is where this, this room basically revolves around putting loops on the end of the line. Uh, so walk into the back here and see the prepping station. Uh, the first step is to prep the end of the line uh, for the welding machine. So we've had a couple different uh, variations of welding machines, right? Mm -hmm. So we've, we've got actually three generations in the room. We've got the latest generation in that box. We built that box because we knew you were coming and <laughs> that's top secret in there. We'll, 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 get, we'll give you a peek in there. So first step is to, to prep the line. Okay. Um, and so what she's doing I'm is sorry, she's, I'm go on this. she's doubling that line over. And then she's adding a, a reinforcement sleeve, which, you know, with a welded line, your, your most vulnerable point is where those two points come together. Yeah. Um, what we add on our lines is a, a piece of reinforcement there that keeps that from coming up. Oh, okay. So we've always done that with spay lines and saltwater lines. And then mm -hmm. about two years ago, we started doing that with trout lines as well. Huh, that's uh, to, way cool. To where any line that's a premier level or above gets that extra sleeve on there. And it pretty much makes them bulletproof at that point. So this is kind of an example of, a, of an end that's it's ready to be welded now. So it's got that extra sleeve on there. Then once that's all welded together, you won't even really know that's Yeah, there. like you, you look at it and it looks like it's just part of the fly line. Yep. It's really cool. Okay, so walk over and we'll see the kind of the first generation of welder. So this is kind of the original machines that, that we built probably 20 plus years ago. Um, so again, we're using hot air and then compression to, to soften that material and squeeze it together. Well, that's a big old, oh, that's like for a... That's a space shooting line, shooting, yeah. yeah. Um, once things are welded, we, all the lines come over here and they go through Maria. Maria's been here for... Maria, hace cuánto? 16, 17? 16 años. 16 años que estás acá? Yo también. Llegué hoy día. So Maria's job is she actually visually inspects every single weld before it leaves the factory. Wow. So she's actually looking at them just to make sure they look good. She'll also do a pull test on uh, oh, a cool. random sample. Because she's the toughest one here, right? She's well, the strongest. We actually got a machine for her yeah. to pull all that on. Um, <laughs> and what we're looking for is we want the, the core to break before the weld does. Ah, and cool. That, and that's what, we're, that's what we get with these welds. Wow. That, that the core will break. Even up to a core that's 50 or 60 pounds, we can get that to break before the, before the weld does. Um, that's pretty, the, the that's pretty awesome. Of the evolution of the loops has been pretty drastic yeah. since yeah. my time of starting here. They were really, they were a weak link in yeah. 2005, 2008. And there was like a constant evolution of how do you make a stronger weld? Yeah. How do you make one that like people can trust and not just yeah. immediately want to cut off a nail knot oh, yeah. or Albright or something? Cause like, honestly, I, I like a nail knot on my like techie dry fly lines. I just like how it goes to the guides. But if I'm saltwater fishing or if I got a, you know, a big game fish, I'm leaving that loop right on there. Totally. Yeah. And I have complete trust in these loops, like yeah. the tarpon, I mean, 100%. This is final step here is the pack out. So all these lines are getting labeled and then put in boxes and, and away they go. And out they go. Yep. So what, another thing we do here is we, uh, we hand tie some leaders, right? Now, most of your leaders today oh, yeah. are tapered leaders, but we do some big game uh, saltwater hand tied leaders that are still super popular. So we're actually tying some, so we have a little bit of a machine assist. So what she's tying right now, she's actually tying 60 pound 
saltwater mono, and then another section of 50 pound saltwater mono down to 30, and then there's a so shock section of 80 pound fluoro. So this is the Addy, she's one of our, one of our knot tires here that does this. Um, but yeah, the, the purpose of the machine is really to allow, we get even force on every single knot. Oh. We also get a consistent pull speed, right? So instead oh. of it like, oh, I'm jerking it really hard or really slow, it's all at the same speed and it's all at the same amount of pressure yeah. that's, that's doing it in. So that's the side that's doubled over. Then now comes the 80 pound. She's tied a few of these before. And then she's got some lubricant that she's putting on there. Cinch that baby up. And there you have it. So you notice that Sweet. as that was pulling that, it was a nice, slow, controlled. Yeah. It took us a while to figure out what that speed needed to be, what the tension needed to be. It's amazing that there's that much tech that goes into just even a the knot. tension at, at which you pull the knot tight. She and a preacher could be called a professional knot tire. <laughs> Get it? No. Dad joke. Brigham. If I can make Brigham laugh behind the camera, I've, I've won. <laughs> Where are we headed now, guys? Uh, we're just gonna head back across the parking lot. We'll walk you through the R&D offices and we'll show you a little bit about what we do over there. Cool. You guys have obviously seen the technology that allows us to make a bunch of different fly lines at the same yeah. time and a bunch of different designs. Uh, there were probably what, like, you know, dozens of fly lines. Dude, I don't even know. At the same time back there. There were some that were like this big around. Exactly, yeah. We got the everything from the biggest of the big down to the super skinny yeah. sinking stuff, Euronymph products, that kind of thing. It's amazing, like, you if you think about the process of putting plastic onto monofilament and getting tapers in there, and that's insane to me. Yeah, so, a, lot of, a lot of work that goes into it. Yeah. If all you ever needed was a general purpose floating five weight line, our catalog would only be one page long, right? <laughs> right. So it's actually yeah. like 90 something. Um, and you know, every, every line's got its right place, its niche application. So what we found is the majority of anglers are looking for something really general purpose. So that's usually somebody you steer towards a Rio Gold or mm -hmm. something like that. It's got a nice uh, sort of medium head length, medium head weight. It's good for a wide range of applications. Uh, and that's usually what people are looking for in my experience. Maybe yours is different standing behind the counter at a shop. No, it's, it's, it's just that, you know, the five and a half weight, you want a, a line that's going to be user friendly that they're going to turn over when they don't wait on their back cast and when they pile it up in front of them. So exactly, you're, you're designing uh, instant casting for some people. You yeah. got it. Yeah. And that's a really important part of our catalog. Uh, but what's fun about being the real line designer is that I almost never have one of these rigged up because I'm usually doing something specialty yeah. if I'm out on the river floating with friends or whatever. This time of year especially, I'm usually carrying two rods with two different lines. One's going to be small dry flies and I use a technical trout double mm -hmm. taper for that. The other is this new line that we just came out with this year, which is the bank robber. Uh, that's perfect for big foamy bugs, yes. uh, like stoneflies, hoppers, what have you. It's also perfect for blocking down the street at Jimmy's and launching that sucker halfway into the intersection and not realizing that there's a car coming. Oh, <laughs> so, perfect. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's very shooty. Like with a nice, fast five weight or six weight, it, it performs really nicely. So. Yep. so those are two winners. I mean, that's cool. fishing situations. We like these. Uh, the nitty gritty details of, of how we design these lines all comes down to weight. So mm -hmm. it's all about controlling where the weight is on the line and how much it weighs in general. So these are both for a five weight rod. Uh, the first one, the small dry fly line is 140 grains at 30 feet. Uh, the next one is 177 grains at 30 feet. So significantly heavier. Mm -hmm. We're talking 37 grain difference, which is yeah. actually close to two line sizes. But we fish them on the same rods and that's all uh, in service of what fly and leader you're trying to turn mm -hmm. over. To put it in terms that are easier to understand, we'll actually weigh a business card here on our grain scale. Does anybody, if you've seen this before, you'll know the answer. Anybody want to guess what a standard business card weighs? It's going to weigh 14 grains. Oh, man, you're pretty close, actually. Dude. Like 17. Holy so crap. You think about the difference between a five-weight line and a six-weight line on your rod. By the AFTA standard, it's only a 20-grain difference, and that equates to the weight of a standard business card more Over or less. 30 feet of the first ball. Feet. Yeah, that's insane. So people get a little bent out of shape sometimes about, like, am I going to break my rod if I overline it? And the answer is 
no. It, it's, <laughs> no. A, it's a business card. It'll be just fine. You know, you can kind of cast anything on anything. The next thing we'll show you just to kind of demonstrate what goes into the design of a fly line is we've got two uh, fly line heads here. These are both from a weight forward fly line. That one's a six weight Rio Gold. So as we said, close to the AFTA standard, just a few grains over. That one's a six weight outbound short. And it's, it's obviously a sinking head. That one is three full AFTA sizes heavy. So like, you know, three sizes heavy. That's crazy. How could that yeah, possibly yeah. work on your rod, right? Go ahead and throw those uh, on that scale too. And you can see how they compare for okay. total head weight there. So that's the outbound short, 237 grains in the head. There's your Rio Gold head, 236. That's insane. So those two weigh the same. They weigh the same, but this is built at the top of the AFTA standard at 30, and that's three sizes up at 30. But the head length is only 30, where when you get to this Rio Gold, you got 48 feet. So we've compressed all that weight into 30 feet and that's what makes the outbounds turn over such a big fly yeah what makes them drive and what makes them shoot so much hmm. whereas you can load your rod just as deeply with a line that's after standard if you're aerializing all that line yeah yeah you're so yeah we talk about that all the time is like if you're not comfortable with like a double haul you can just get like 30 feet out and just go you know shoot it whereas like the double taper i like that a lot because i like to carry a lot of line behind me better for accuracy, aerial mends, that kind of stuff. So there's exactly. a line really for everybody. Brigham just likes the pretty colors. Hey Cheech, do you know if Ranzetti's gonna make the orange vice? Cause if they do, I really want one really bad. And she just like, I'm <laughs> if they're thinking about it, I'm gonna tell them not to. <laughs> <laughs> At the end of the day, we have all these different tapers, but we need to go fish them to really see, right? Exactly. And so. I wasn't kidding. I don't have a, a real gold rigged up usually. I've usually got my double taper technical trout here and then also the, the bank robber for this time of year. So maybe we'll go tomorrow, we'll throw some foam on the bank robber, we'll find some bank feeders hopefully and feed them with the, the technical trout. I'm down. Cool. I've been practicing casting since like last week for this. Oh, you're going to do great. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Exactly, kind of what that rig was designed for, the technical trout, long leader. Small little dry flies, making those really precise casts just to get it right on a seam line like that. Oh, he wanted it, he wanted it. Green Drake, last chance. Mm -hmm. 